Her last book, On the Outside Looking In, A Year in an Inner City High School, was a finalist for the LA Times Book Prize and was selected as one of the best books of the year by the New York Public Library. But none of these impressive credentials were enough to gain her access to a publicly funded institution just up the road from here, MCI Framingham. It would take endless months and two elaborate court battles to get Rathbone just inside Framingham's visiting room, which begs the question, why work so hard? There are stories to be found everywhere. The, her new book, A World Apart, is the answer. In this book, Rathbone exposes the aching and sometimes explosive tensions between a massive, opaque bureaucracy whose primary aim seems to be self-preservation and propagation, and the very real women who live within and despite its whim. And here to share it with us, please welcome Tina Rathbone. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Um, it has been a long process, and different people here have been with me for different amounts of time of that process. Um, one friend, Leah, has been with me through the whole process, and one time when I found I couldn't get into the prison and was really disheartened about it, I remember Leah sitting with me and very calmly saying, you could write this book the way archaeologists work. You could, you could just, instead of having the dinosaur, you could look at the dinosaur's footprint and still write the book. <laughs> um, so I just thought I'd mention that. It's taken a team to do this book. Um, I couldn't decide what to read. The, the story is so huge and the issues so multiple. I couldn't think of a way to touch each one of them um, and have it make any sense at all. So I sort of gave up and decided just to read from chapter one. I've cut out the first few pages um, where I just talk a little bit about the surprises of a women's prison, how it isn't at all like a men's prison, and how even the women who are, in, who are incarcerated there are really amazed by how it is when they first arrive. So I'm afraid you miss all that. Um, and this is a chapter that deals with the main character in the book, who I call Denise, throughout the book. And the Center for New Words were really adamant that I read for a solid 20 minutes, so I'm sorry, it really is a solid 20 minutes. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> the first few weeks had been terrible, of course. Frightening and degrading and completely unnerving. Just try to imagine it, Denise told me. Everything was gone. My son my home, my family, my car, my friends, my cigarettes, my alcohol, my drugs, my clothes, my makeup, my dishes, my paintings, my socks, my glasses, my bills, my life. Not to mention my dignity and my self-esteem, which wasn't much anyways. Everything. In a way, though, the shock and anxiety of it all had protected her back then, too. One minute, Denise had been at home, packing her son, Pat, brand new Nintendo and his smart new clothes into the case she brought with him to her mother-in-law's house. The next, she was inmate number F24447, being stripped naked, checked for STDs, and asked if she felt depressed by someone in a uniform on the other side of a desk. This last question seemed the cruelest of all, because it wasn't as if she cared, the nurse or whoever she was. She didn't even look up from the checklist in front of her when she asked. And how was Denise supposed to feel anyway, facing five years and a day in this place? She cried all night, every night that first week. She didn't know, yet, how expensive collect call rates were from prison, so she spent hours on the phone with her mother and her son, and endlessly marched around the yard, the headphones of her prison-bought Walkman turned to heavy metal, because she knew enough, even then, to stay away from anything in the least bit emotional. It only made her cry. Then, two weeks after she'd arrived in August, just as her fixed daily routine had begun to numb her, three correctional officers unlocked the door to her room in the middle of the night. Denise Russell? Denise Russell? they asked, shining their flashlights in her face, so that before she was fully awake, she knew something terrible had happened. Silently, the officers escorted her down linoleum-tiled corridors and through clanking metal doors to the health services unit. There, a nurse asked her to sit down, then told her that her son had just threatened to kill himself. He'd walked into her mother-in-law's living room with a knife, she said. They needed her permission to have him admitted to a psychiatric hospital. Pat was her little, just nine-year-old boy. And right then, he was in the admitting room of a state-run psychiatric hospital up in Maine someplace, while she, his mother, was in the health services unit of MCI Framingham, flanked by guards and hundreds of miles away. 
Someone passed her a phone, and she found herself speaking to a nurse up in Maine who tried to assure her that Pat would be well taken care of. Denise felt she had no choice. She gave her permission for him to be admitted, handed the receiver back to the prison nurse, who had a few words with her counterpart in Maine, and then hung it back in its cradle. After that, there was nothing to do. It was hard to fully conceive of, but there was nothing in the world Denise could do then to help her son. She felt like throwing up. Time slowed after that. She no longer marched around the yard. Even that much activity threw her impotence into glaring relief. Sometimes she held her breath. She called her mother. She called her father. Then she called her mother again, over and over, because it was a terrible place where they had Pat, she was discovering. The prison wouldn't let her visit, of course, but they did allow her to call once a week, and Pat almost always came to the phone sobbing. He missed her. That was all, he said. And he worried about her, and he'd even tried to come and find her, but they put him in restraints when he did that. In four-point restraints, he said. The messages she got from her own parents didn't help. Her mother went to visit and came back horrified. Her father told her he thought it looked like a fine place. Neither was able to take Patrick in. They'd both remarried and had their own lives to lead. Patrick's father, Alan, was willing to have him, but Denise couldn't even begin to think about the consequences of that. Alan was a lunatic, a, stealth, a self-styled Christian with a history of violence and manic depression. And besides, he'd moved to Hawaii the year before, and Denise would lose all contact with Patrick if he moved out there. She took the pills that psychiatric services had prescribed and tried to sleep. But she'd known something like this would happen. That was the thing. She'd done her best to avert it. She'd set up her mother-in-law's house as best she could with a TV, a VCR, and a brand new Super Nintendo she'd bought for Pat with some of the proceeds of the furniture sale she'd held before going away. She'd even arranged his Beanie Baby collection, creature by creature, so he'd feel more or less at home in his new room. But what, really, could she do to make up for her sudden and disastrous absence? Pat was nine. His mother was in prison. His father was in Hawaii. He was, suddenly, unprotected. She took more pills. This was the nature of life in prison, Denise knew now, having to shut down whole parts of yourself to compartmentalize. Over 60% of the women at Framingham were on some kind of psychotropic drug to help with this process, and though this internal division of the self into a series of solitary, isolated cells seemed like a further incarceration, it was, for some, the only way they could begin to tolerate their complete impotence in the world. Most, it has to be said, had spent their lives reaching for medication at the first sign of discomfort. Across the nation, more than nine out of ten incarcerated women are drug addicts, and a full half are actually drunk or high at the time of their arrest. The addicts in Framingham divide into two main camps, the crackheads and the smackheads, and there's very little difference in the way they detox in prison. Unless you're pregnant, when the stress to the baby is deemed too dangerous, you go cold turkey. Framingham has two entire wards for women who come in high. Each year, 900 women use these 29 beds to get clean. The rooms reek of vomit, and the li green liquid feces they release in all-night convulsions, along with the last traces of drugs from their bodies. Residence in these wards is so dreaded, in fact, that women in the know do everything they can to avoid being placed in them, and there are often one or two inmates in the mainstream residential units detoxing on their own. Sometimes there are illegal drugs in Framingham, too, but very rarely, nowhere near enough to sustain an addiction, and mostly the women are forced to make do with fermented jello juice when they want to get high. Wine, they call it. Jello wine. For the first few weeks... Denise allowed herself to believe that the outside world was still her realm. Frantic in confinement, she somehow managed to stand for inmate count four times a day, to march through corridors at the appointed times for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and to sit down quietly on her bed as she was locked into her room every night. But somewhere deep down, she persisted in believing that this mindlessly repetitive and passive routine was only some kind of dream, or mistake, or bizarre experiment even, that would end soon, prompting everyone to step out of their roles and smile, perhaps just a little bit abashed by all they'd subjected her to, before sending her on her way. How could all the accumulated weight of adult life, the rent and the food on the table, the work, the men fending them off while keeping them keen, and the bills, mostly the bills, how could all that so suddenly disappear? Denise was the first to admit that she hadn't been your typical Susie homemaker, of course. She'd been a crack addict for a start, a relatively functioning suburban one, unlike many of the women in Framingham who'd spent years living on the streets of Boston and Worcester, but a crack addict nonetheless. 
When she finally left Alan, she'd become a stripper, too. It hadn't been an ideal life. No one's in prison had. But she'd learned to enjoy dancing, had been proud of the independence $400 a day so instantly brought her, the car she'd bought, and the new furniture for the apartment she and Pat shared. She'd done okay by him overall, kept him fed and clothed and well taken care of the way a mother should. And now, suddenly, here she was, a child again herself, being fed huge, unappetizing meals three times a day, and locked into what she'd quickly learned to call her room, never her cell, at nine o'clock every night, with nothing more pressing to do than watch bad TV or stare inanely out the window. The prison sits at the edge of town, and when it's dark out and the lights are on in the women's rooms, there's no place to undress in private. There are no window coverings of any kind at Framingham. The new director of security had demanded their removal recently, and most of the women complained bitterly about this. But Denise found a measure of relief in the space the clear window provided. She could see a residential street from her bunk, houses and cars and people coming home from work. For a time, she enjoyed letting her mind drift through all that life to thoughts of her future and memories of her past. Now that Patrick was in hospital, though, she was increasingly interrupted from these soft focus reveries by images so sharp that they felt almost physical. She'd see him fishing on the beach, or playing soccer, or, once, staring calmly at her from across the emergency room, covered with bruises sustained at age three at the hands of his father. Alan had been abusive for years by then, hitting Denise and throwing things, and leaving her and Pat for days at a time with no money at all. But that was the first time he'd ever hit Pat. The boy had marks from Alan's hand imprinted on his neck in black and blue. Denise panicked. The bruises were identical to the ones Alan had left around her own neck when she'd first tried to leave him. She was determined to press charges, but the police persuaded her not to. She was a what? An exotic dancer? She'd be dragged through the courts herself, they told her. They'd take her son away for sure. So she took out a restraining order instead, and when Patrick's bruises finally disappeared, she put the incident out of her mind and went back to work. She felt pretty much fine, she thought, when she started dancing again for the daytime crowd at the club where she worked. When, on her second day back, an okay-looking guy with a lot of cash came in and asked her to sit with him, she did. He bought a bottle of mums for $200, which meant a $40 commission for Denise, for her gracious company, they used to say, but this didn't cheer her the way it normally would. Even when he ordered a bottle of Dom Perignon, a $60 commission, her mood didn't lift. Next thing she knew, she was sitting there with this guy who called himself Bill and his half-empty bottle of Dom Perignon, all dressed up in her thigh-length boots and her see-through black robe, sobbing. She felt terrible for that poor guy, Bill. They wouldn't even give him a refund, she remembered, but there was nothing she could do to stop crying. Even after her boss yelled at her to get over here and then sent her home in a cab with $500 and strict instructions not to come back for a week, she couldn't calm down. All she could think about was Pat and Alan. She would never be free of him. Denise was usually good at controlling her emotions, but she'd never felt so sad and angry as she did those days after Alan first turned on Patrick. She wanted to die. There was nothing vague or hazy about the desire. She wanted to stop existing, to disappear. Back in her apartment, she locked herself in her bedroom, sobbing. Pat grew scared and started banging on her door, all two and a half feet of him, screaming and pushing and kicking. When she finally opened it, he came rushing over to her, getting in her face with tissues and worry and questions until she screamed at him. My God, it was hard remembering this. Screamed at him really loud. Get away! I hate you! She would never forget the look on his face. Her three-year-old boy, beautiful and innocent and so hurt already, crumpling then into silence. Denise didn't sleep on nights like that, even with the pills. Like most mothers at Framingham, she hadn't seen her son once since coming to prison. Even if he weren't locked up in the hospital, his grandmother would have found it impossible to make the long trek down to the prison from Maine. Surprisingly, though, she'd almost grown used to his physical absence. It was the spectral visitations she couldn't handle. The memories. Night after night, she'd force herself to stare out the window and see them. Pat running to her, laughing. Pat helping cut coupons. Pat losing it in the kitchen when Denise told him she'd be going away until she began to suspect that torturing herself like this was foolish and masochistic, even selfish in a way. Sorry. By the middle of November, three months after she first arrived at Framingham, it seemed clear that Patrick would move out to Hawaii to live with his father. 
His insurance had run out, so the hospital couldn't keep him, and Denise's parents continued to insist that they couldn't take him in. This left Alan or the foster care, and from what everyone told Denise, anything was better than the foster care system. At least Alan was family, and he'd been in a program, she kept telling herself. He was involved with the church again, too, and he must be working, because he had his own apartment, apparently, in a fancy condo complex called Gentle Bay. It was still tempting to dwell on the dangers that might lurk for Patrick there, on his mood swings, his drinking, his obsession with paid sex. But after a while, Denise began to see that it did her son no good to drive, himself, to drive herself crazy that way. Five years of it, and she'd end up embittered and enraged, and even less capable of caring for Patrick than she'd been when she was high on coke and taking her clothes off for a living. She was beginning to see, all around her, examples of what happened if you allowed these strands of your old life to get tangled into knots of rage and despair. Some woman would explode in rebellion, call a CO a woman-hating faggot who couldn't make it in a men's prison, or spit at him, or throw a fit and get themselves hauled off to solitary confinement in the hole for a week or a month or more. Others turned the pain inward and mutilated themselves with blades extracted from razors. It was an old story, and a predictable one. When all else failed, when connections with family were severed, or when parents died or children were adopted away, there was always the visible and finite certainty of a razor's deep incursion into flesh. Wrists, arms, necks, legs. Over and over they cut themselves, until even Denise began to respond more with irritation than with sympathy. Oh, God, not again. Not another interruption, another mess to clean up. No. In order to survive in prison, you had to give way to it, Denise began to see. You had to engage. The trouble was there was so little in prison to engage with. College-level courses weren't available to women who didn't already have 16 credits, which Denise didn't. She'd married before she'd even thought about college. She had graduated high school, so there was no point enrolling in GED classes. The manicuring class had a waiting list that stretched on for months, as did the computer class. There was a place available in construction arts, the prison's only other job training program, so Denise wound up keeping her mornings busy by climbing up and down ladders with a hard hat on, hammering and painting and fixing things up. She started going to church again, too. It didn't much matter which denomination. She found a measure of redemption in them all, and she spent hours reading the fashion magazines her mother sent her from home and compiling a collection of low-fat, high-nutrition recipes that she arranged in perfect alphabetical order in her room. With the help of a check bouncer named Teresa, who lived on her unit, Denise also learned how to prefer, prepare relatively wholesome, nutrition, nutritionally balanced meals for herself out of ingredients available from Canteen, the prison store. Tuna and peanut salad for protein, chicken broth for ease. Anything to avoid the dining hall meals, which consisted of rice and potatoes mostly, and were designed to subdue, she was convinced. All you had to do was look at the women who ate in the dining hall every day, at their slow, lumbering progress down the corridors, and their shortness of breath. Later, Denise made a deal with a diabetic woman in the room next door who qualified for a special diet. For a dollar eighty a week, about half a weekly wage in prison, Denise gave her three Diet Cokes in exchange for her extra mini cereal box, her small carton of milk, and her piece of fresh fruit every morning. Like everyone else, she still binged every now and then, Twix bars mostly, on the days canteen items were delivered, but with the help of a regular power walk routine she'd established for herself in the yard, she managed to keep in pretty good shape except for her teeth. There was one small rectangle of polished stainless steel in her room that served as a mirror, and when she checked her appearance there each morning, she couldn't help noticing that her gums were beginning to recede. Trips to the dentist were not generally recommended, however. Like many prison employees, he was said to find women most interesting around the chest area, and dental hygiene projects was, products were strangely unavailable at Framingham, even through canteen. Floss, for example, was strictly prohibited, though even after six months Denise still found it hard to discern exactly why. A kind of floss did circulate around the prison. It was made of nylon, which workers in the flag factory smuggled out for the purpose. Unlike almost everything else at Framingham, the smugglers gave it out free to anyone who wanted it. But the thread was harsh and unsanitary, and the one time Denise tried it, it had cut her gums and made them bleed. For a while she was so desperate that she thought about asking someone to smuggle some into her through the mail, threaded through the page of a letter, perhaps, or stuck in a book. But then she heard that Wendy, the upscale and rather beautiful brothel madame from Laurel Unit, had been caught recently doing the exact same thing and sent down to the hole. Denise dropped the idea. The last place she ever wanted to be was the hole. 
Besides, she tried to console herself, what good was even the best kind of waxed floss when the only toothbrushes available were ridiculously small and so soft bristled that they left your teeth feeling as furry and ridged as if they'd never been brushed at all? She went to her construction art classes and tried not to think about it. She prayed. She power-walked around the yard with a woman named Carol, a DWY who made her laugh, and started hanging out a little with Fly, a crazy Puerto Rican butch who'd stood up for her one day when she'd wanted to watch Private Homes instead of Divorce Court on the dayroom TV. Of course, she still worried about Pat, sometimes to the point of hysteria. But with the telephone system the way it was, collect calls only, and absolutely no connection to Hawaii, collect or otherwise, there was no way on earth she could speak to him. She did everything she could to change this, talked to her unit manager and wrote letters to her lawyers. She even submitted formal requests for a phone system pass to the superintendent and to the newly arrived director of security, but nothing had come of it. So now, aside from writing to Pat all the time and sending a video of herself reading to him through a program sponsored by the Catholic chaplain, she had trained herself to live with that gaping vortex of fear and guilt and was managing, pretty much, to keep focused on her much-reduced present instead which is to say that she'd finally constructed a box around Pat, too. Everyone had to do it sooner or later, she understood now. If they didn't, the pain drove them crazy, and every year one or two tried to kill themselves as a result by hanging themselves with strips of twisted sheet in their rooms. Then came Christmas. Everything pales beside the agonies of Christmas in prison. All the holidays are bad, birthdays, New Year's, Thanksgiving and Easter, but Christmas is the worst. The administration did allow a party for the handful of kids who could make it, but for some reason it was held in November. Half-torn decorations remained up on the visiting room walls for several weeks after that, but no decorations were allowed elsewhere in the facility. Women who received cards stuck them with dabs of toothpaste, which froze like glue against the section of painted freeze block where such things were allowed, and that felt nice and new and hopeful. But there were no other concessions to the holidays. None. The guards, who always seemed so distant and unapproachable to Denise, were sullen, worse than usual. Even the food was unchanged. Chicken burrito this year, and beans. Denise brushed her teeth. She pulled her hair back and then dabbed illegal foundation on her cheeks, fresh from a free sample pouch in Glamour magazine. Some of the women had made presents for one another, packages of Twinkies and Hershey's Kisses from Canteen, They'd even wrapped them with holiday images from old magazines and had made cards or bought them from Louise, a wheeler dealer with artistic talent who sold individualized drawings for two dollars. Denise had prepared five or six of these gifts herself. Some moisturizing cream for Julia, who always complained of dry skin. Salami and crackers for Fly. Pepsis for Charlene, who never had any money and who longed always for the cans of cold soda. She could hear some of them exchanging their presents out in the day room now, but this only made her feel worse. It was Christmas outside. At home, she and Patrick had had a creche that they put up every year, and a collection of miniature houses, too, the kind that light up inside. They were expensive, those little houses, but Denise had bought two new ones every year, and they spent hours laying them out with tiny people, benches, streetlights, and trees, before spreading white cotton all around to look like snow. They'd had a good-sized town by the time Denise left, almost like the real town of New Bedford, they used to think but there'd be no snow for Pat this year. Not in Hawaii. Denise pulled out the photos his father had sent. Patrick was grinning hugely in most of them, straddling the seat of Alan's new golden motorbike. He'd grown. The day she was arrested, he'd been small enough to bury his head in her chest when he sat on her lap. Police had forced her onto the floor in handcuffs, and when Patrick came back home and saw her, he screamed so desperately that an officer unlocked Denise's handcuffs and let him sit on her lap. There he sat, wiping her tears. This was another one of those memories she never wanted to have, Pat wiping her tears away as she wiped his. Denise gathered up the few gifts she'd prepared for her friends and headed for the day room. Just then, out of nowhere, the Catholic chaplain and a group of volunteers burst into the unit. Dressed in red felt hats and bright red scarves, they danced around the place like goofballs, Denise thought, adorable and generous goofballs. And they handed out gifts, delicately wrapped packages containing hand lotions and sweet-smelling soap, and, miraculously, tucked into the corner, real, medium-bristled, full-sized toothbrushes. Denise couldn't believe it. A real adult toothbrush. Her new roommate had just shown her how to twist strips of, a, of garbage bag into smooth, floss-like strings, and now this. 
For a moment the wonder of it completely overwhelmed her. Then she rushed back into her room, ignoring the photographs of Patrick spread out on her bunk now, and got to work qu quickly assembling things to trade. The Twix bars she'd been keeping, and her tuna and beans and peanuts, even the sodas she'd put aside for the diabetic woman. Then she went to the day room, where everyone was still gathered, and let it be known that she was trading for toothbrushes. Not the canteen kind, but the one Sister Maureen had just given out. She could make the next year bearable, she thought, if she just traded right. Thanks. My oldest boy, who's six, just had a, a reading at his school yesterday. It was called Awesome Authors Day. And this is what they said when they finished reading. Are there any questions or comments? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, are there any questions or comments? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That description was so Oh, yes. Um, so I think the question is to talk a little bit about the control that the... I have to repeat the questions for the video. <laughs> um, the control that the DOC has over just every aspect of life in prison. Yeah. In particular, the questions around media access, <clears throat> which is a big issue nationwide. Um, as the prison boom continues, um, so media access decreases in inverse proportion pretty much to, to the numbers of incarcerated people. Um, and Massachusetts used to have a fairly tolerant-sounding policy towards the media. Um, I have it written down, actually. Conditions in a state correction institute are a matter of interest to the general public, they stated, and the department has a proactive posture when communicating with the media. Th those were the circumstances when I first tried to get access to Framingham. Um, it's one of those situations where these are the things that are written down, but the reality is very different indeed. They had just five specific things, five specific breakings of rules that they could that they could prevent the media from coming in if you'd ever had a criminal record, for example, if you'd ever been expelled from an a institute before, things like this, none of which applied to my particular request. And so they finally denied my request on an invented reason, which was that they were worried that the victims of the women's crimes would be upset by the book. <clears throat> I then told them if they had any, if any of the women that I told them I was wanting to interview were particularly notorious, I didn't know their crimes at that point, um, that I would be happy to, you know, not select them um, because, you know, it, and on a certain level it could be valid. But no, they weren't interested in that at all. Um, though they did offer, if they could select the women I would speak with, they would think about it. That, that was the. Um, we went to court. The ACLU helped a lot, and um, a lawyer from Bingham Matuchin. Um, did the work pro bono, and we won that case, and I and I got access, minute access. I had asked specifically for um, access only to the visiting room, with um, obeying all the rules that a normal visitor would obey. So they had to put on no extra staff. They had to do nothing special. I would just be another visitor, um, and that's what I ended up winning. <clears throat> about a year later, um, I found out about a Girl Scouts program in the prison, a wonderful program which brought and brings um, every two weeks the daughters of incarcerated women to come and have a Girl Scout meeting with their mothers in prison. It's not at all, um, it's not a complicated program, but it's wonderful because it brings the women every two weeks. I had thought that the prison would be pleased that I was going to be paying attention to such a good program, but of course they said no. And... Um, and so I sued them again. And that the second lawsuit <laughs> was longer. Um, the DOC backed down about 10 minutes before the first hearing on the first lawsuit. The second lawsuit, they did not back down. And um, we ended seeing three different judges. Um, and it took about a year and a half. And finally, the, the last judge, Judge Janet Sanders, um, ruled overwhelmingly in our favor. Um, and I gained access. 
a few months to the Girl Scouts program. A few months after that, however, the Department of Corrections rewrote all of their media access regulations. So now, and, and there's a new commissioner, Kathleen Dennehy, who um, seems to be intent on bringing reform to the prisons, perhaps. She has not, however, changed the media access regulations, and when I asked her just a week ago um, if she was intending to, she, she sort of muffed the question. She said she was intending to at some point later down the line. Um, but it's still the same. Um, now they do not say that conditions in state correctional facilities are of interest to the general public. Now do they, they do not say that they have a proactive um, position towards the media. Instead, they've given um, five new blocks that they can call up. Um, first of all, anyone who is granted access can only interview an inmate in the presence and under the supervision of a correctional employee. So, obviously, when I met with the women, we were in a visiting room, but we were not sitting with a correction officer, and we certainly weren't under the supervision individually of anyone. Um, there's no contact now anymore ever allowed with anyone in solitary or in segregation. Um, no cameras or tape recorders are allowed at all, ever, in um, almost all of the facilities in this state. And then the two most troubling things that stand still today that you would imagine are illegal, but which aren't illegal, are um, the DOC can look at the maintenance of legitimate penological interests when considering whether to allow a journalist in to do any kind of reporting whatsoever. And most heinously, they are allowed to consider, and this is a direct quote, whether such access would result in significant benefit to law enforcement agencies. And if they conclude that it won't result in significant benefit to law enforcement agencies, they can say no. So that's where we stand right now. So the question was whether those are regulations or if they were a statement. No, those are the official CMR regulations, which stand um, as official DOC policy. They have to have a public hearing when they when they change these kinds of things, and they did have a public hearing. Um, however, they do not have to respond to any of the public's comments. They're under no mandate whatsoever. And in fact, when I spoke with Commissioner Dennehy um, about a year and a half ago, she said it was incredibly rare that anyone in the DOC even heard what the public's comments were. And, and tellingly and sadly, I was the only representative of the media who stood up to speak at the hearing. There were several media there covering the hearing. But um, no one was very up in arms about it because, because it's such a pain to report in prisons anyway. Um, that it didn't affect many people's lives. Um, the question is how I got interested in it in the first place. Um, my last book was about children, uh, teenagers who were uh, uh, looked to be headed um, for trouble with the law. <clears throat> and initially I thought that I would do my second book about kids in prison. Um, for a variety of reasons, I realized I couldn't do that book. Um, and the, the balance of power was too skewed, um, and I just didn't have the psychological training. Um, and after having met with a young girl in prison, I just realized I, I just couldn't do it. So sort of by default, I decided, oh, well, I'll, I'll do women in prison. I'll do their moms. Um, and it was... Uh, you know, I think if I'd known anything at all about it, I really wouldn't have done it. <laughs> so, um, because it's it's pretty depressing. So, I think a certain naivety takes you a long way in those beginning stages. Yeah. How did um, the women who you met with in the visiting room? Yeah. How did they get chosen? What was the process? It was um, it was not very scientific, I have to admit. Um, the Denise I met. Um, through an organization called FAM, Families Against Mandatory Minimums. And um, the woman um, who runs, Nancy Brown, who runs the Northeast chapter of FAM, um, gave me a, a bunch of names of women, and I contacted a lot of them. Um, and Denise and I um, just got on very well from the very first meeting. And I met with her for a long time. And then through Denise and the other women I met through FAM, I met all different kinds of people. So none of it came from the DOC. Um, I met all different kinds of people, and over time they whittled down to a group of four or five that I spent most time with. But I tried to make sure that 
you know, they were in some way representative of the prison population. Though I do not claim that they are completely representative. So these questions are really long to repeat, but the question overall is about children and women and what kind of programs there are at MCI Framingham available. Um, what, uh, the Girl Scouts Beyond Bars is a, is a pretty small program. Um, I'm guessing, I don't know precisely, but I would guess somewhere between 11 and 13 <coughs> mothers and their children participate. Um, it's kind of hard for a woman to get into the program. There's obviously a huge waiting list, and then you have to have you have to have been convicted of a non-violent crime, which obviously almost 80% of the women are, so that's not that much of a hurdle. But um, you have to also have a perfect disciplinary record at Framingham and any small mess-up, um, and they can boot you out of the program or not let you in. There's also a big problem with um, the girls, the children, joining the program. Many of them live with their grandmothers, the mothers of the women in prison. And many of the grandmothers are reluctant to have their grandchildren a, sort of mingle with the grandchildren of, or with the daughters of other women in prison, or they don't want them to be whisked off to Framingham every two weeks. And so there's a lot of reluctance and issues of trust that end, too. Um, there is another organization called AIM, um, which uh, provides help keeping mothers and children connected. But there is that's pretty much it. I mean, the DOC would disagree with me. They would say that they have a number of programs that are all to do with children and parents and parenting classes, um, but they're all minute, and they all have huge waiting lists, and most of them don't do that specific thing of bringing the child to the prison. Of course, if your child's in DSS, um, the state is mandated to bring your child for visits at once every blue moon, really, but um, there's not enough, nowhere near enough, and it's a huge issue facing women in prison. Falling off, yeah. Yeah. Can you talk about the bit in the book about the history of MCI Framingham and what it, it used to look like? Mm. Um, MCI Framingham opened in 1877. It's the longest running women's prison in America. And it's also um, the place where the most incredible reforms have taken place. MCI Framingham, in its time, has been an incredible, wonderful, um, forward looking place of reform. Um, it was opened in a fanfare of reform, but that's too long. Uh, just the fact that there was a, a prison just for women was an amazing thing, because before that, women were just sort of huddled in an attic um, of men's prisons and just left to rot. Literally, they were just left in that room. Occasionally, someone brought them up food. Occasionally, people came to rape them, but otherwise, they were just left alone in that room. No exercise, no work, no job training, no nothing. So the idea of just a prison just for women was tremendously progressive at that time. Um, and for many decades it remained progressive, though it would, it would go back and forth between periods of reform and periods of repression. The greatest time in Framingham's history, I think, um, was from 1932 up until the late 50s, when a woman, my heroine, Dr. Miriam Van Waters, took over the prison um, and built a huge farm, introduced hundreds of classes and educational opportunities, choirs, speaking forums, poetry classes, lecturing circuits, a newspaper, um, woodworking, hiking, everything you can imagine was at this place. Um, Dr. Van Waters realized that most women in prison are serving time for behavioral crimes, not the type of crimes that men serve time for, but crimes like being drunk, sex crimes, um, you know, non-violent behavioral crimes. And she realized that if, if reform was really to be aimed at, you needed to not only provide education and job training to the women in prison, but also give them a sense of worth and give them a sense of being alive. Um, and that's what she did through all these incredible programs, and it was an extraordinary place, and the women came out of there and went on and worked, and the letters between the women and Miriam Van Waters are just extraordinary reading. Um, real re reform was going on, and no one debated it. 
When you get too much reform going on in a system, though, people get scared. And that's always what's happened in the history of women in prison. You get a certain amount of reform, and then it starts to get visible beyond the walls of the prison. And then the people in control of the system as a whole start to think, if prison starts to be a great thing, crime is going to go crazy. No one's going to be afraid of anything anymore. No, 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 no. And they clamp down. And how they've tended to do it historically with women reformers in women's prisons is they create a scandal of some kind, they run it in the tabloids, um, and they demolish the, the reformer. Miriam Van Waters was accused of, of you know, having a dull racket at the prison, this like wild lesbian sex going through the prison. Um, she had a hearing and, and cleared her name and was reinstated. But the damage was done, and within 10 years of her retirement, Framingham was back where it is today. All of her programs, she had a nursery where kids were there with, her, with, with the mothers. She had everything. It was all gone. All gone. Um, the women you interviewed, uh, did some of them participate in some? I know there are some, there are some programs at Framingham. I'm wondering what their experience was, whether they did find some good programs or some good therapist or, you know, anything. Mm. Denise certainly really liked her therapist. Um, she really liked group therapy. Um, and and I think there are, they have a lot of students who work there, and I think that a lot of them are very dedicated and provide, if not even care, at least um, caring care. Um, there's also a mandatory drug program. It's mandatory for most of the women as they're mostly serving time for drugs, which... Um, I don't really know if it's effective or not, but it at least gives the women something to do um, during the day, the day. I've heard many stories from different people about the effectiveness of those programs or not. I, I'm not in a position to say one way or the other. I think it's a lot of um, shuffling of feet, really. Um, you have these women there captive, literally. Um, and no, nowhere near enough programming is provided. Though, I mean, someone like Denise did spend her five years in prison thinking a lot. Um, and it was a question I used to ask her a lot. It's like, okay, well, if the system is just so abysmal as it is, then how come you're changing your life here? And we would write back and forth about it. She's obviously a very intelligent woman. Um, and she did it despite the system. She did it despite the system. And a lot of women do, and it's amazing to see. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. And, and as I recall, there was this big scandal where someone said, they had even set up, a, a, and it was at Framingham that they had set up um, a computer service bureau. Hmm. And um, there were men there who were really the ones who were running the computer service bureau who were also inmates. And then all of a sudden, because That's they right. were bringing money in, they, they, they were accused of dealing drugs. And then one night, the National Guard came in and took all of the men who were at Framingham and took them to other prisons. Hmm. But that was in the 70s. Hmm. That's right. In, I, I knew that in the 70s, men and women were in Framingham, and I knew that all kinds of chaos went on as a result of that. But, um, yeah, well, I was speaking with a DOC representative um, can't remember his name right now, but he was talking to me about the fluff programs they had in the 70s. <laughs> so that's uh, that would fall into that category probably. <clears throat> I mean, as is always, that's the thing, and that's the interesting thing looking at the history is that this has been proven time and time again, and it, it's no longer it can no longer be the question um, because it's just been proven too many times. So the question then becomes, okay, is the fact that education in prison does reduce recidivism? a good enough reason to provide education. There's no other question that, that can truly be asked in this day and age. Yeah, Teresa. Yeah, I, Is it known the numbers that, that do go back to the drugs? Hmm. Does anybody in the audience... I don't have those figures. It's Yeah, it's high, but I... Sorry. Um, recidivism rates, the, the numbers of women who are released and then return to Framingham. Huh. 
Is that women or is that everybody? Overall, it's two out of three within three years, men and women. That's, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. There actually is a beautiful library which was built by Van Waters or by Jessie Hodder or a former before her with stained glass windows, um, very beautiful. And when I was given my very um, protracted media tour around MCI Framingham, they of course took us to the library um, and it had a, a librarian who was extremely friendly. Um, I never ever in my whole time there ever heard a woman mention the library, but yes, they do have a beautiful library. <laughs> the question was, did I intend to, to be there for the whole of Denise's sentence? And um, definitely not. <clears throat> it unfolded that way because it, I'm a really slow writer, and <laughs> um, it just took a long time to do. Um, there were all these <clears throat> problems, too, the, all of this legal access business, and um, it just took a really long time. The visiting hours... And the fact that, you know, every time you went to prison, you ended up waiting for hours and getting there and getting back. It was just very, very drawn out. Um, I'd been used to being able to just hang out with the people that I write about endlessly, and this was very different. <clears throat> I'm trying to think sort of uh, the question was did I have boundary questions and complications with the women um, the immediate answer that comes to mind is that there was initially <clears throat> when I first arrived at the prison a reporter's here let's get her to get us out of here so there was a lot of um, my hearing this and that and this and the judge and the lawyer and all this legal stuff um, about which I have no understanding. <clears throat> Women, you know, they were desperate. And so they were meeting with me and telling me the problems with their case. And <clears throat> I ended up stating very clearly at the beginning, at the first meeting with every woman, that <clears throat> this book was not about that, that I was not a lawyer, I didn't know anything about the law, and that <clears throat> I wasn't going to be able to get anybody out of prison. So that was one very clear thing that came up. There were occasional requests where um, women would ask me to do something that was illegal, minutely illegal, but illegal nonetheless. Um, <clears throat> there's a system in prison called the three-way mail, where women, you're not allowed to send mail from one facility to another facility. Um, but of course, many of the women have relationships with many of the men in prison. And so to facilitate the mailing system, uh, you, the letter is stamped on the back with a, this is sent from a prison stamp. Um, so they'll, they'll send their letters to someone on the outside and have the person send it to the other institution. And um, so there were things like that. I mean, that was the, the most minute one. Um, and I got very nervous about it, um, not so much because of boundaries, because I didn't have any problems with sending the letters morally myself, but because I knew that if the DOC had the, even the tiniest excuse to kick me out, they would. And so several times I did find myself saying no to things that I didn't want to say no to. Yeah, But there was never anything, like in the second lawsuit, um, the DOC were trying to say in one of the hearings that, you know, maybe I would be duped into selling drugs or passing on messages or bringing in weapons, and there was never remotely anything like that, ever. Um, and then I've bec I have become friends with um, a number of the women in the book, and so there aren't really any boundaries anymore. Um, I think um, the amount of sex that goes on in prison, male and female sex, guard on inmate sex, um, was very profoundly surprising to me um, for a long time. And um, 
the amount of um, self-violence that goes on in prison too. Um, Kenneth Applebaum, who at least used to run um, the psychiatric services for U out of UMass for, for all of the Department of Corrections in Massachusetts now, said that um, there are two or three, what is it? I have it here. There are two or three serious suicide attempts, three to four serious suicide attempts a month in Framingham. Um, and that doesn't include self-cutting incidents. They're not counted as serious suicide attempts. Um, so it's pretty intense there. Um, those were the dark side. And then on the brighter side, the um, lack of violence between inmates was very surprising to me. The, because I had this idea that it was like a men's prison only with scary women, you know. Um, and not, th there's hardly any of that. Um, and in fact, it's, it feels much more like a, like a high school than you would imagine a prison feeling. It's just a bunch of women doing what women do, which is get into little cliques and then, you know, try to get into other cliques and, you know, incredibly <laughs> intricate hierarchical systems. Um, and that was surprising, too. Yes, it The official community was guards, inmates, supposedly. The, you know, the overt official system was that. The covert official system was guards and inmates, sometimes philandering, all very hush-hush, all... Um, though there's no such thing as consensual sex between guards and inmates, um, the women claimed that the sex was consensual. So it's not like rape, rape, like you imagine, violent physical coercion. Um, but that's very complicated to get into that. So, And then the, the, the system between the women themselves very much depended on what group you were in as a woman. If the lifers were the ones who created real, actual families... They would create a mother and a father and children and even nieces and nephews and grandchildren would come in. Um, and these were all very structured. And the mother would be called Ma and the father would be called Pa. And the children, everybody would have their role. Um, and those, those functioned absolutely as families, often quite dysfunctional families, um, sad to say. Um, Otherwise, um, the friendships that were formed by the women were very intense, and many women fear their absence when they leave prison um, and flounder because of their absence. Once again, they're on their own, and they've formed friendships, the like of which they've never formed before, because they're sober for a start. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Hello. I just told them I was writing about them <laughs> um, and women in prison. <clears throat> and um, I've actually only given the book so far to Denise. <clears throat> I was very nervous about it. And uh, she's out now, so it's very easy to see her. And, um, and anyway, so she read it, and she said, I kept on telling her she was going to hate me, and she told me that she didn't hate me. <laughs> so... Yeah. Is it possible to send that book inside through the publisher? That's another story. The books yeah. cannot be sent inside unless they're ordered. Um, I, I, Denise, actually, I spoke with her today, and she said she's been writing frantic letters to everyone at Framingham saying, oh, the book's out, the book's out. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, they, cut, they, they can't legally ban it. I mean, maybe it would be it if it comes through the publisher. There's no prison book program anymore. <laughs> No, it has to come, you can't, or nor from the bookstore, it has to come direct from the publisher. Yeah. Um, exactly. How long has, has it been that the book's been out, and have you gotten uh, many reviews, and uh, you know, what sort of uh, publications have reviewed the book? I'm mm. hoping it's just out. I'm hoping everybody in the United States reads it. Thank you. Me too. Unlikely, <laughs> <laughs> uh, The question is, how long has the book been out? It's only been out since Tuesday. So, um, yeah, so, um, so far, it's, thank you.
reviews remain to be seen. Um, you know, it's difficult. Um, there is a review in O Magazine, however, in June, and um, that's nice. And um, there's one forthcoming by Francine Prose. Thank you, Leo. Very positive, very nice review. Um, and the Globe say that they have one. Um, uh, I don't know if it's been written yet, but I don't know when it will come out, and various newspapers around the place. But, I mean, that it's true that, you know, women in prison... Um, a lot of people don't really care very much, and so you do get a lot of that, oh, women in prison, <laughs> um, turning away. So we'll see. I think it will happen slowly, though, but I think it will happen. But it is endorsed by Eve Ensler. It is endorsed by Eve Ensler. <clears throat> you know it does, and we're doing an event in New York um, in June 2nd, and that'll, that'll be really good, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I was a little startled also by what you said about the sex, and I'm wondering how, um, how current your data is. Like, when was the last time that you were written in? I mean, has there been a decrease? That I don't know. Um, the last time I was really in was about it. Sorry, um, how current is my data around um, guard on inmate sex, and has there been a decrease? Um, Specifically, maybe since Kathleen Dennehy's taken over. I have no idea. Um, the last time I was really in was about a year and a half ago. <clears throat> Certainly, um, off the record, unofficial um, stories um, without me having been in prison suggest that it continues apace. Um, but I don't know. I mean, the DOC were, of course, very shady about this whole thing. Um, but they did finally give me some figures. Um, and they confessed that they had... Um, pursued, I think it was 62 um, official investigations over the past five years. Yeah, 62 official investigations over the past five years. They found that 31 were unfounded, so 31 were just a woman saying, oh, he messed with me. 21 were unsubstantiated, meaning not unfounded, but with no proof. Seven were substantiated, and only two referred to the DA. Um, in all the legal documents, every every accusation that substantiated needs to be sent to the DA's office immediately. I didn't get an explanation as to why the others hadn't been sent. But the fact that they had 62 official investigations um, means the numbers are mar far, far higher because most of the women do claim that the relationships are consensual and wouldn't um, report it because they get sent to the hole. Um, so, but, but it, there is absolutely no way to prove any of it. Well, I'd love to talk to you about that later. Hmm. It's getting kind of hot in here. Are, th are there any other questions, or shall we all... Leah? You can absolutely say no, but are you willing to tell what you're working on now? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm working on maybe a, a book about myself. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's the shortest possible version. <laughs> Sorry. And God. <laughs> the question is, um, what am I thinking about writing, working on now? Christianity. Really. And now I blush. <laughs> are, we, are we done? Thank you all so much for, for being here. I really appreciate it.